Well, today we are experiencing a gentle experiment in two ways. Um, firstly, um, apart from some big events in the church calendar, uh, we don't often have theme services. Um, and encouraged, really, by churches internationally, um, we thought we'd do something about climate justice before we get to Harvest Festival. I'm going to say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, but secondly, also, um, now we're back to uh, a slightly different, more informal approach in a normally quite traditional church for our music group, you Eucharist. Um, we are, as you say, looking at how we do liturgy of the word. It doesn't always have to be the same way. You can have a traditional collect and you can have readings, uh, but you can also have interviews. It doesn't mean it's always going to be like that on the third Sunday, but it can be. We can be flexible. The rules of the church allow it. Next Sunday the choir will be back, and if you're missing the choir, uh, we'll have a very traditional Battle of Britain service this evening as part of Choral Evensong. And while I get, before I get stuck in to climate justice, um, it's wonderful to see families here. Um, one of the things we try and do on the third Sunday, but some of our regulars weren't coming today, is to have young people reading and doing the prayers. So if anyone under the age of 16 is willing to do readings in future, if they can let somebody know, I uh, don't want to scare you off, but you'd be really welcome. Um, and you can do uh, a reading and take part in our service in, in different ways. We can find another way to involve you. If not, if you don't like reading, for example. Now, on the theme of climate justice, I want to just ask a question, and I want everyone to think about it, which is this. I would like you just to take a moment, however old you are, whether the oldest person in church or the youngest. <laughs> I'm being video. <laughs> to think about something in the natural world, so I'm not thinking about a person, something that God has created in the natural world which is precious to you, precious, possibly beautiful, but somehow fragile that it might be affected by what we're coming to call the climate emergency. Just hold that thought. And then keeping that thought, just imagine what the world would be like if that thing wasn't there anymore. How would you feel? We don't want these third Sunday services to be any longer than necessary, so I'm not going to ask individual responses for that, but maybe spend some of the day just carrying that thought forward, and it might affect your prayers. Um, the thing that I was thinking about when I was wondering what kind of question I might ask at the beginning of this talk um, doesn't fit perfectly into that category, but it is relevant, and I offer it just as one example. Um, but there are, there are so many, aren't there? And that's the gift of water. I mean, in our own lifetimes, in our world, we're not really likely, in most parts of this country, to not have a fresh water supply all of the time, at least I hope not. But it's something we take for granted, and it's something that people in many parts of the world don't even have yet. So just thinking about a precious thing that's fragile and vulnerable, I think just brings us closer to the, the needs of the world and what we might need to do about it. Well, why climate justice and why in 2021? It's fitting that it comes, perhaps, after a year of pandemic, but that's not why. We will have Harvest Festival in only a couple of weeks, but our church council, um, inspired by some people showing leadership, decided that we should set aside a Sunday before Harvest Festival. I love Harvest Festival or Harvest Thanksgiving, but it's always cool. But it has a focus on saying thank you, a focus on gratitude. 
And what the churches are doing by setting up what's coming to be called a season of creation is just encouraging congregations to look forward to harvest that season of thankfulness with a special focus, just remembering that these things that we say thank you for might not always be there. And the reason that it's happening in this country, especially in 2021, is, as you know, COP26, the 26th conference on that theme, is coming up in Glasgow. And our church council was one of many, we did a survey in our congregation that signed up to urge those who we've elected to do all they can to make a difference, not only for the sake of our own country and for future generations, but also for the sake of the world. Now this is not anything new. Before harvest festivals even started, before Christianity even came, the ancient people of the world would have prayed to their gods that there would be a spring and a summer, because they, they, they didn't know whether there would be. Every winter they were plunged into darkness, they were living in very primitive conditions, and in all different human communities there was a prayer that the crops would survive, that there would be a harvest, that there would be a summer. We might think about the industrial revolution and the revolution rather and the havoc that it created on our own environment. I'm so grateful to those interviews earlier on. The difference between then and now is a lack of awareness. Obviously, we can look back at the Industrial Revolution with hindsight. But we can think about the social movements that responded to the Industrial Revolution and the effect that it had not only on the countryside, but also on human beings, on families, on how the system ill-treated families, sometimes threw them into poverty, starvation, and risk of serious injury. And then later on, when the countryside was being despoiled and being at risk in all kinds of ways, movements such as the National Trust were started to make a difference. And just imagine if those things hadn't happened. And then more recently, in my lifetime and the lifetimes of anyone here my age or older, we had the threat of potential nuclear conflict. And those of us who lived through that will remember how worrying that was and how it made us pray. The difference between now and then came out very nicely in the interviews with Christine and Andrew. The difference is twofold. Firstly, we are both aware of the risk and the dangers. We can't ignore it unless we listen frankly to misinformation. But also, people have the potential to make a change that they didn't really have, at least not in a simple and straightforward way, when there was a Cold War going on. We have the potential to change things, but things will only change if they start with us. We used to call it global warning, warming. We're encouraged to think of a climate emergency now because so many people think that this is a problem for the future, for future generations that may not necessarily affect us. And if we live in Stenning, if we live comfortably, it's true that for some of us here, it may not have a huge impact on us. This is about others. And one thing we didn't change for this slightly experimental service was today's gospel because it seemed so appropriate. Why did Jesus take a little child and set that boy or girl before the disciples? As an example of what it means that in God's kingdom the last are first and the first are last, but also because of the nature of childhood. And the wonderful thing about parables is that they don't have just one meaning. Parables, being metaphors, have layers of meaning. And all my life, because it's such a familiar parable, I've been thinking about what it meant when Jesus took a child. In Matthew's Gospel, he said, it's to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. It doesn't mean 
that he thought that every child is perfectly innocent. But there is something special about a child, something obvious about a child's vulnerability, for example. When we are grown up, we can forget that we are vulnerable and we can't get life without dependence on God, but also on each other. But also, given that it's young people now who are those voices that are calling most strongly for change, it seems that it's right, that it's at the heart of today's Gospel. We just missed, actually, the climate justice window. I think last week was the last Sunday that we were really meant to have the service. But we've got two weeks before Harvest Festival, and you've got the rest of your lives to make a difference. And there are three things that we can do. Now, in the Gospel, we heard about the disciples competing with one another and wanting to be first. So it's not a question of who is the best person at recycling or comparing yourself with anyone else. It's about comparing what you can do tomorrow with what you did yesterday. And the things we can do, not you, we, me too, are to pray, to make ourselves more aware of what's going on, to take more of an interest in the news, even if it depresses us, and to take some action. Christine, you didn't cover it in the interview, so you, you can tell me now and remind me. There is a website, and it will be on the bulletin in coming weeks, where not only can each parish church sign up to something called being an eco-church, where we can try and do more as a congregation to improve our environmental credentials and just improve every year. There's also one for households, and it is called... Creation Care. Creation Care. www.creationcare.org. UK. So for those of you who have the web, there's even a system there where you can do a questionnaire and compare yourself with what you did yesterday. But I know not everyone's got the web, but you kind of know, don't you, the things that you're doing already and the things you could be doing more of. That is just one example. And let us pray, above all, it's about prayer, information and action, that when we are set free, we will celebrate with God and travel home in peace as mountains and hill will sing as we pass by and even trees will clap their hands. Amen.